was devised as a means of perpetuating a secret kind of knowledge under the symbolism of chemistry. The one of chemistry chose. Let us read the reply by asking another question. Why did the Dionysians and later Masonic organizations use architecture for exactly the same purpose? In other words, we know uh, that the Dionysians believed that the building of a temple was a symbol a symbolization of the building of society and of the human soul. But at a time when it seemed advisable to move in secrecy, the active properties of the esoteric law were concealed under appropriate figures and devices. And just as the building of Solomon's temple came to mean the building of human society, so the transmutation of metals came to mean the transmutation of the personal and collective life of humanity. Thus in alchemy, the entire weight of an important philosophical system was trusted to chemistry and chemical chemistry. We may say that this was suitable and proper for the reason that against this symbolism there was no well-integrated body of opposition. And these philosophers revealed themselves as philosophers. They would have been persecuted. Had they advanced their ideas on a religious level, they would have been executed. Had they attempted to develop psychological training, they would probably have fallen victim uh, to the Inquisition. But as chemists, they had several appeals. First of all, medicine and the chemical sciences were accepted by theology. They were accepted as necessary, and the uh, church had no direct opposition to the advancement of medical science. It did not agree with it particularly, but it accepted it. Now let us pass for a moment to another group, and this is the group of the chemists. The doctors, the chemists, and those who had to do with research in metals, metallurgy, the things of that nature, all who touched fire as a means of working the elements of that craft were bound together. And this mysterious body of chemists, although it did not build cities at the foot of cathedral, was in things of that nature, was an integrated body, and it was also in close relation to the crafts of the builders. After a great deal of research, I was finally able to recover ancient drawings of the original doors of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The reason that was important was that the original doors, which were removed at the time of the French Revolution, that these doors, which were cast in bronze, and I suppose it would have been the work of the devil. All such interesting things were at that time. <laughs> All of these doors was the complete formula of alchemical transmutation. The doors were a mass of hermetic symbols. Now these doors could not have been placed there by the chemists, unless these chemists had also been in very intimate association with the cathedral builders. It was part of the same type of fuel. Another guild that is a very great interest to us is the bookmakers' guild, the printers. And if you study the columns and trade emblems and symbols of the great presses like Gutenberg and Fuss and Caxton, you will find that each one of these presses had its master's mark, and that these book builders and makers were also bound together in the fraternity, which is the reason why it was possible through the few people in very modern period for ciphers and secret devices of all kinds to be introduced into books. This could not have taken place that it's not been for the guilds, this tremendous body of men who were bound together by a common purpose. And that common purpose was the restoration of the golden age in the world. He describes a pro procession in Egypt, which apparently he had seen. A sacred ritualistic processional involving uh, the custodians and bearers of the books of Hermes. He describes how a procession of priests and savants, teachers, moved in very sacred ritualistic order, each with an appropriate symbol and wearing certain insignia indicating the department of learning over which he presided. 
Clement also says that to earn these distinctions of learning, it was necessary for these scribes, scholars, and priests to have memorized certain books of Hermes. Some three books, some four books, some ten books. These very period. In this period of wandering, uh, the Hermetic philosophy began to change its shape, sh change its uh, presentation. Much of its so-called broadness was lost. The original books of Hermes uh, came to be regarded as merely the outer surface of a larger literature, and the entire subject gradually uh, emphasized its scientific import and became practically synonymous with medicine. Thus we have a complete literature dealing with the medical arts, and, of course, one of the prime elements in medicine, chemistry. Chemistry, of course, in those days was without boundaries such as we know now. Chemistry in China, in India, Arabia, was alchemy. And alchemy was a fantastic conglomeration of ancient beliefs and modern experimentation. But the name of Hermes began to appear on the titles, pages, and among the emblemata of alchemy. He became accredited with the preparation of uh, chemical formulas, means of transmuting metals. He was even accredited with the discovery of gunpowder. Now this is so totally different uh, from the corpus hermeticum of ancient times that we must pause. Yet we must also remember the words uh, of Clement of Alexandria in the Spermata where he tells us that in this procession of priests there were some who carried the symbols of medicine, chemistry, and other arts. Upon perhaps this very slender foundation, Hermes was elevated to become the patron genius of uh, medieval Hermeticism. The great awareness of drug use came slightly later, uh, and strangely enough, uh, the drug was opium. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's interesting, the history of opium. You know, we think of, of uh, opium and its derivatives, uh, junk and heroin, as just the lowest, well, maybe crack is now the lowest of the low, but anyway, it's a real scuzzball drug according to most people's opinion. But did you know that no, they had been using opium for 3,000 years before anybody noticed that it was an addicting drug? It was not ever noted that opium was addicting until 1611 when John Playfair, a very famous English physician, wrote a book in which he commented on opium and said, uh, once one has begun the habit of opium, it must be maintained unto death. So uh, in, the, in the 30 years after D, there was a great hermeticist and alchemical thinker named Paracelsus who arose on the European continent. Paracelsus is an interesting guy. He's essentially the inventor of drugs because he was the first person to extract herbs and to get this notion of the essence that there's that if you have a medicinal plant then there's something in there which you want to get out and concentrate he called his school of of uh, alchemy iatrochemistry the doctor's chemistry and he invented pills of the ordinary sort and uh, and uh, he said, I have made a great discovery. The center of my alchemical opus rests with the magic of laudanum, which was, of course, gum opium. Uh, there, there was a craze in the late 15th century among alchemists for opium. The, the alchemist von Helmuth 
uh, he, he signed some of his alchemical tracts, Dr. Opiatus. He, he was uh, the first croaker. <laughs> <laughs>